All right. Good morning, everybody. We'd like to welcome you to the Sunday School Live of Grace Ministers of Henderson, North Carolina. We have already been blessed this morning with a sunrise service by Pastor Janie at the property. We were always sitting in the cars and tooting the horns and praising the Lord. And he had a good message, and we were blessed. And now we're going to continue to worship the Lord on this resurrection day. And what we're going to talk about today is it's going to be kind of touchy a little bit to some people. But we just want to get the true meaning of the resurrection, what it means, and how we can just be rest assured that we have everlasting life. So before we start, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time to study your precious word. And God, I pray, Lord, you just honor your word, bless it. The Lord, give us clarity of thought in the things we study. God, you bring to our minds. And God, we prepare. But God, this is your lesson. So you teach it the way you would have it. Speak through my lips the words you would have the people to hear. Prepare our hearts for the message this morning that we may learn and grow and mature in our faith and have peace, knowing, God, that we are saved forevermore. And God, we'll thank you and we'll praise you, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Now, you hear a lot of messages preached on the resurrection, of different aspects of it, but I'm going to come at it kind of a little bit different this morning. You know, there's a lot of Christians living in uncertainty. They are kind of afraid they can't worship completely in freedom because some people think that you can lose your salvation. Once you've been saved, they think that you can lose your salvation. But we're going to prove that the resurrection day gives absolute biblical proof that you cannot lose your salvation. You are saved for eternity. Your salvation is everlasting. You cannot lose it. No one can take it from you, and you can't even take yourself away from it. So we're going to look at the scriptures this morning to see what God's Word says about this. Now, the first thing we need to know about the Resurrection Sunday, did you know before Jesus Christ died on that cross and was resurrected that anybody outside of the Jewish nation had no hope? We could not be saved. We were doomed, condemned, and on our, on, and on our way to hell. The Bible clearly teaches that when Jesus came the first time, he came to the nation of Israel, his chosen people, to be their Messiah, their king. But they refused him. They reject him. But let's look at some of the scriptures to prove. Go to the book of Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at that scripture. I mean, chapter 10, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 10. And let's see what Jesus says about preaching a message to the Jews. Now remember, you need to get a clear understanding. Jesus came to the Jews and nobody else. So chapter 10, the first few verses, names the, the disciples that he called. Now we're going to start reading with verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not. But rather go to the lost sheep, of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. See, when Jesus came, he came to the Jews. The Gentiles is anybody outside of the Jewish nation, which includes us. He didn't send the gospel to us to start with. We were outside, even the Samaritans, which was a mixed race of Jews and Samaritans, and he told them not to go where they were at, not to preach to them, not to teach or anything else. They were without hope. So you just need to remember that before the resurrection, that's where we were at. Now, now we got a lot of gratitude and thanks for the, to the Jewish people because if they had not rejected him, if they had received him, you know what would have happened? We would have had no chance of ever being saved. So you think about this. If the Jews had received Jesus Christ as their king and Messiah when he first came, then we would still be lost in our sins, no way to be hope, saved, no hope of salvation. We would be doomed to a devil's hell. But as we know, the Bible teaches they rejected him, they refused him. And and on the, before Palm Sunday, when he was going into Jerusalem, he stood out over on the Mount of Olives over Jerusalem, looked out over Jerusalem, and he cried out. Let's see what he said. In, in Matthew chapter 23, start reading in verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? And ye would not. 
Behold, your house is left desolate unto you desolate. Verse 39. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now you need to understand when you study the scriptures, when Jesus came the first time to the Jews, he came to them as a nation, God's chosen people, not as individuals, but as a nation. And when the nation refused him, he laid them aside. He said, okay, I'm through with you. I'm going to leave you to your self stuff and you do your own thing. I would have gathered you like children, uh, chicken on the uh, hen's wings, but you would not. So look in verse uh, 38 one more time. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So what he did, he turned away from the nation of Israel. He did not disown them and completely do away with them. He just turned them aside, dealing with them as a nation. And after that, he's going to deal with them as individuals like he does in the church age, which we're going to see in a few minutes. But he laid them aside. He said, you're going to be alone. I'm not going to be with you as a nation anymore. You didn't want me? Fine. So I'm going to turn you over to yourself and let you have it your way. So now, all right, now go to the book of Ephesians. This is going to be our main scriptures. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to start reading with verse 11. But there's one thing I want you to know. Remember, remember, when Jesus came the first time, he came to the Jewish nation. And if they had received him, we would be have no hope of salvation. He didn't come to, to save us to start with, but because they refused. We have an opportunity. Let's look what the scripture says. In Ephesians chapter 2, start reading with verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. Now look at verse 12. Man, this is a powerful statement. This is who you were before Resurrection Sunday before the Jews refused Christ, rejected him, and had him crucified on the cross, this is the state that we were in, and if they had received him, we would still be in this condition. But thanks be to God, when Israel turned their backs on, on Jesus, he turned to the Gentiles to call out a people for his name's sake. But look in verse 12. Now this is the state we were in, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Is that awesome or not? That's how we were. Let's read that verse again. That's worth repeating again. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's who we were before he was crucified, but when he raised from the grave, we have a hope we're going to see and look at a lot of scriptures this morning. So I hope you got your Bibles, maybe a pencil and a piece of paper, you can write some of them down. But let's continue to read right here. Look in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, what a powerful statement. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to making himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were not. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Okay, now I'm going to save that last verse for later. Now, after Jesus raised from the dead, he appeared to the disciples, which were apostles at that time. He appeared to them, and he gave them a new commission. Since the Jews had refused him, he turned to the Gentiles to call out a people for his namesake, and he gave them the commission to go out and preach the gospel. Remember the first time he told them not to go into the city of the Gentiles, nor into the way of the Samaritans, but only to the house of Israel. Now keep that thought in mind. Now look, now let's see where, where I want to go here. Okay, in Acts 1.8, he sent them out. He gave them a commission. It says in the book of Acts, he's telling the disciples, 
that angels will tell them, said, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the other most parts of the earth. Remember the first time he told them not to go into the city of the Samaritans? But now he's given them the commandment to go into the city of the Samaritans because now the gospel is presented to the entire world. Bless his holy name. And we see in Acts chapter 15, verses 7 and 14, where God turned to the Gentiles to call out a people for his name's sake. Okay, then we see in Romans 1, 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Bless his holy name. Remember, the first time it was to the Jews only, but now the gospel is to the Jews first, and also to the Gentiles, which that includes us. Bless his holy name. Now the gospel is sent out to whosoever will, tells us in John chapter 1 and verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he powers to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And in the gospel of John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So now the gospel is not only for the Jews, it's for the Gentiles also. So now in the church age, which is composed of both Jews and Gentiles, God is no longer dealing with Israel as a nation. Right now, he's dealing with Israel as individuals, just like the Gentiles. Every individual Jew has to come to Jesus Christ the same way the Gentiles do, both Jews and Gentiles. Look at the scripture we read up, up, up above. It says, look at verse 14, For he is our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of petition. Making both one, he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. We are now equal in God's eyes, the Jews and the Gentiles. And he says he's broken down the middle wall of petition. Now, to understand a lot of what we're teaching, especially next week, you need to understand a lot about when God first came on the scene, he chose uh, Israel as a chosen people for him as a chosen nation. He established an order of worship. He gave them the pattern to build a tabernacle. He set up the way the tabernacle was to be built. And the people that were to work in the tabernacle, the instruments that were in the tabernacle, the priesthood, and so forth on down the line. The Jews had to bring a sacrifice for their sins and offer it on the brazen altar. The priest would take it and kill it and take the shed blood and sprinkle it on the altar and so forth. And then he would take the blood sacrifice into the holy place and pray for the people. But in the courtyard, when you first come into the tabernacle and into the, to the temple, there was a wall built about four, maybe five feet high had a small opening in that wall. And it had a big sign right there next to the opening in that wall where the Gentiles could not go beyond that point. The Gentiles was excluded from the temple worship, tabernacle worship, and they couldn't go beyond that wall. But when Christ died on the cross, it says in verse 14, that middle wall of petition was torn down. It was destroyed. Remember when Christ died on the cross, how the veil in the temple was rent, torn in two from top to bottom to make access directly straight to God. So when that middle wall of petition was torn down, the Gentiles, which are we, have an opportunity now to approach God directly. So thank God that he tore that wall of petition down, and we both have access. And look at verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the image, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to making himself a twain, one new man, so making peace, and that he may reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the image thereby. Now the church is, is called the body of Christ, and the members in the body of Christ are made up both of Jews and Gentiles. Bless his holy name. We are included in that. So you've got to remember that. And we here's one thing we really need to remember that God is no respecter of a person. God is no respecter of a person. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy. Go over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to look at this scripture. If you don't have it on the line, you need to underline it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 
And we're going to start reading with verse 3. And look at this. For it is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Man, is that powerful or not? Said, but all men, he was willing that all men be saved. And, God, and Christ gave his life that all might be saved. And he gave his life a ransom that we could be saved. And it tells us in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, said the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men can't slackness, but is long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So now salvation is open to all and to anyone and to whosoever will, Jew and Gentile. And we just have to thank the God. We got to thank the Lord for that. And it tells us in, in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, Romans chapter 2, verse 11, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 6, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 9, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 17 says, God is no respecter a person. Bless his holy name. See, salvation is for everybody. God does not favor one particular race, creed, color, person, Jew, Gentile, over one another. We're all equal in God's eyes. He's no respect of person. And I wish a lot of denominations, I wish a lot of churches, I wish a lot of pastors, and I even wish a lot of Christians would take that to heart. We are not to be respect of person. We do not pick and choose who we want to come in our church. We do not pick and choose who comes into our Sunday school class. We do not pick and choose who we witness to. We do not pick and choose where we want to go out on visitation. We go where the Holy Spirit leads us. Salvation is for the entire world. He says in Mark, uh, yeah, Mark 16, 15, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We are to preach, we are to teach, we are to disciple, we are to have love and compassion on, on every precious soul under God's bright sun. We are not to have, show respect to persons, and please keep that in mind. We are not to show respect to persons. we got to love everyone, and that's what we want to try to do. Now, salvation is for everyone and everybody. We got to know that in John 3, 16, John 5, 11, 12. Now, here's where it's going to get touchy. Thank God when Jesus Christ died on that cross. He died one time, he offered his blood one time, and he gave us eternal, everlasting life. And we're going to look at a lot of scriptures this morning in just a few minutes. Now, a lot of people are not settled on this issue of eternal security. Once saved, always saved, everlasting life. Save forever. Look up the words everlasting, eternal, and forever and see what they mean. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, when he says everlasting life or eternal life or save forever and ever, he doesn't mean saved until you mess up or until you commit a sin until you do something wrong and then you're going to lose your salvation and then you got to worry about trying to get saved again. There are so many Christians walking around today under the bondage of the fear of they're going to do something, they're going to lose their salvation, they're going to commit a sin, and then they're going to be doomed for hell if they don't get saved again. I'm so glad that I'm not, I don't live under that bondage. I've been set free. I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that I'm saved forever throughout eternity, and there's nothing and no one can separate me from that. Now, let's look at some scriptures. If you got a pen, write these down. Let's look at this right now. Your salvation is secure. Pastor James was preaching a lot about that this morning, about security and salvation. If you don't have security, how can you have peace of mind? How can you enjoy your salvation? How can you be a happy Christian worried about you might do something that you're going to lose your salvation or God might take it away from you or you can take yourself out? I'm going to prove to you you cannot do that. All right, let's look at the first scripture. God gives everlasting life, John 3, 16. Let's quote it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have ever, ever, everlasting life. What a powerful scripture. Now, the second one, Jesus says he will lose no one. Now, go to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Turn to the Gospel of John in chapter 6. Now, these are some powerful scriptures right here, folks. Look at them. Now, let's just see what the Word of God says. I know the denominations teach so-and-so, preachers teach so-and-so, Sunday school teachers teach so-and-so, but what does the Word of God say? Just go to God's Word and see what He says. Look in John chapter 6, look at verse 39. And this is the Father's will which have sent me, that of all which He hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. Now, he's not going to lose you. Now, go, go to the gospel. You're still in John. Go to chapter 10. Let's go to chapter 10. And I'm going to start reading at verse 27. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, you know, I can't lose my salvation. And some people say, well, you know, you can't take me out of God's hand. But some of them will say, well, you can take yourself out of God's hand. No, you cannot. And these are the scriptures right here to prove to you that no one can take you out of God's hand, and you cannot take yourself out of God's hand. What does the Word of God say? Let's read it. John chapter 10, look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them, what? Eternal life. And they shall, what? Never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now, what do you see in those scriptures? Eternal life, never perish. You cannot, nobody can take you out of the Father's hand, and nobody can take you out of Jesus' hand. Folks, we are in the hand of Jesus, the hollow of his hand. We are safe. We are secure. No one can take you out of that hand, and you cannot take yourself out of that hand. Bless his holy name. All right, let's look at the next scripture. Did you know you're kept by God's power? You're not saved by yourself, and you're not kept by yourself. Go to 2 Timothy. Go to the book of 2 Timothy. Go. That's right after 1 Timothy. Go to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 1. And let's look at this. See, you don't have to worry about keeping your salvation. You don't have to worry about keeping yourself, keeping your soul safe. Because you are kept by God, you are kept by Jesus Christ, and you are in their hand. Look in verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Now look at this. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Folks, are you persuaded today that you're safe in the Lord Jesus Christ? And do you know whom you have believed in? Do you really know Jesus? Do you really understand what, what that sacrificial death on that cross of Calvary meant on, on Easter weekend and then on the resurrection day? Man, the work was completed. It was finished. We're going to see that in a few minutes. But we are kept we are secure. We could not lose our salvation even if we wanted to. Now go to the book of 1 Peter chapter 1. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be, be revealed in the last day. See, you're kept by the power of God, and you're kept by the power of Jesus and by his word, and don't you ever forget that. Now, the biggest thing is you got to know for a fact that when you were saved, the Holy Spirit came within your heart to live with inside of you. The Bible says what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Now, we are kept, okay? 
Now, I want you to go to one of the main scriptures. Go back to the book of Romans in chapter 8. Go to Romans chapter 8. We're going to read some powerful scriptures right here. Romans chapter 8. We done found out then you can't, nobody can take you out of God's hand. Nobody can take you out of Jesus' hand. That includes you. You can't take yourself out. You're kept by the power of God. Now, what, now, to lose your salvation, you would have to be separated from God, right? You'd have to be separated from Jesus Christ. So, can you be separated from Jesus Christ? The Bible teaches, no, you cannot. You, you can break that fellowship, but you cannot be separated from him eternal. Your soul is secure. Your salvation is secure. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 and start reading with verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Now look at these last two verses, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded. Do you remember hearing that word? Persuaded? Sure, we read it in the second Timothy, I think, 112. I'm persuaded because I know whom I have believed. I am absolutely persuaded. I am convinced. You cannot persuade me, convince me any other way than other. I am saved, everlasting, eternal, forever. I am secure in my salvation. I do not have to worry about losing my salvation. I just enjoy it. Now look at verse 38. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Bless his holy name. In those two verses right there, 38 and 39, you have everything that you will ever be confronted with, that you will ever face with, that Satan could ever come against you with, and that cannot separate you from the love of God, which is in your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, now let's put the icing on the cake. Go to the book of Ephesians. Go back to the book of Ephesians. Back, go forward to the book of Ephesians. I'm sorry. Go forward. To Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. A lot of you know this scripture. Now, when God saves you and the Holy Spirit comes within your heart, something happens. You belong to Him. You've been bought with the price. Now, in the Old Testament time, when somebody bought something, they were sending a document to somebody, they will put their seal on that object or whatever it was. They will put a seal on it, saying that this is mine. Nobody else can touch it. Nobody else can take it. This belongs to me. Now, when you were saved, God saved you, and he put a seal on you. And what was that seal? Let's look in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed, sealed unto the day of, rede of redemption. God put a seal on you. He owns you. You belong to him. Nobody can break that seal. Nobody can take you out of his hand. Nobody can take you out of Jesus' hand. There's nothing can separate you from the love of God. You have eternal, everlasting life, folks. Just listen to what God's word says. He says, until the day of redemption, that we've said before, when you're saved, your soul has been redeemed. Your soul is what has been redeemed at this time. This body has not been redeemed. You still have this old sinful nature of flesh that you're living in day to day. And the Apostle Paul talks about that in the book of Romans, especially in uh, chapter 7 and chapter 8, where there's a warfare going on. You have a battle every day. You have a spiritual nature and you have the human nature. You have a, a physical nature. And those two natures are battling constantly every day. And that's where your battle comes from, that inner conflict between the spirit and through the uh, physical nature of a man. So the soul has been redeemed. But one day these bodies are going to be redeemed. These bodies are going to be redeemed. You'll see that in the book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. But the last part is we're waiting for the redemption of our bodies. One day these bodies are going to be redeemed. And what day, when, what day will that be? 
That's going to be the day that the rapture takes place. These bodies are going to be changed. This corruption is going to put in on incorruption. This mortal is going to put on immortality. And we're going to have a glorified, resurrected body exactly like the Lord Jesus Christ. So these bodies are going to be redeemed one day and just bless his holy name for it. Okay, let's see. And God will finish what he started. Go, go forward a little bit over to the book of Philippians. Now, when God starts something, you better believe that he's going to finish it. When God saved you, he started to work in you, and he's, he's working on you now, and he's going to finish that work one day. Let's look in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. Verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which have begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Okay, you have all three works of your salvation. Now, you have justification, you have sanctification, and you have glorification. He which have begun a good work in you, that's, that's justification. You've been justified. You've been freed from the penalty of sin. You're no longer guilty of sin in God's eyes. For the penalty of death of sin, of sin is death. You're no longer under the death sentence of the penalty of sin for death. You've been justified. Now, we'll perform it. That's sanctification. Sanctification simply means you're set apart, and that's a daily process. God is sanctifying you daily. He's setting you apart. He's using you, equipping you, training you to where you to serve him day by day. That's a daily process. That's a continuous process. Justification was a one-time act. You're justified one time and one time only. You're saved one time and one time only. Completed act. Okay, and then sanctification is a daily process. Okay, then the last, and we'll complete that until the last day, which means when that body is redeemed and glorified, then your salvation is complete. You'll be justified, you'll be sanctified, and then you will be glorified. So you have all three works of salvation now, justification, sanctification, and glorification. You have the past tense, the present tense, and the future tense. And you're delivered from the penalty of sin. You've been delivered from the penalty of sin. You are being delivered from the power of sin. And one day, you will be delivered from the presence of sin. Bless his holy name. So that's all the scriptures I have this morning on this, on eternal security. And I pray that you've written them down. If not, go back and look at this on Facebook where you can stop and start. Write these scriptures down and look at them and take them at face value. And when you we talk about studying God's word, have a good dictionary and good concordance. If you got a dictionary, look up these words that throws you like eternal and everlasting and persuaded and so forth on down line. Look them up and you will begin to understand no matter what your denomination teaches, no matter what your preacher says, or your Sunday school says, or anything else. What does the Word of God say? You know, Paul commended uh, Christians in Berea more than he did in those in Thessalonica for one reason. He said, And these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind, and searched the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. And I'm sure some of you have heard something this morning that you probably had been taught, or you don't clearly understand it, or you may not agree with it. But just take God's word and study, read the scriptures, take it literally, take it at face value, and you will begin to be able to enjoy your salvation and not worry about losing it and, you know, under bondage with it and can't enjoy your salvation. Now, to top all of this off, next week we're going to continue this study, and I want you to do something. I'm going to give you some homework. Next week, I want you to take your Bible to the book of Hebrews, and I want you to read four chapters next week. Chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. And this will verify everything that we have taught from the Word of God this morning. I promise you, if you study Hebrews chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10, and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and teach you your understanding of eternal security, I think, will be settled forevermore. You'll be a happy camper, and you can enjoy your salvation because we got to remember, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he had a threefold office to uphold. He was prophet, he is now priest, and one day he will be king. Prophet, priest, and king. 
and to understand the full uh, source of salvation, you've got to understand the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the priesthood in the Old Testament. Now, when God established the worship in the Old Testament, he set up a tabernacle, then they built a temple for worship. They had rules to go by, ordinances to go by. The priest would offer the sacrifice and the people would bring the sacrifice. The priest would kill it, take the blood, and go before God's throne and offer sacrifices for the people. And they did this daily. You need to understand that. Start reading in Exodus chapter 34 and only into part of Leviticus to understand the sacrificial system. And then when you get to the book of Hebrews, those four chapters we're going to read, Jesus Christ is now our great high priest sitting on the right hand of God. And what a significance that that's going to teach you and going to show you. So if you'll just take this week and study those four, not just read them, but study them. And take note on the words you see once, one, and so forth, one time, no more and so forth, and just look at it, and it will instruct you and ask the Holy Spirit to teach you as you read and as you study that you will be prepared next Sunday when we teach. You will have an understanding of what we're going to say. It all comes down to three words that Jesus said on the cross. And when you study those four chapters, you will get a clear understanding of next to the last saying Jesus had on the cross when he was being crucified. He had seven sins, saying number six, it is finished. Look up the word finished and see what that means. It is finished. And that will nail it down, I promise you. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this time of study. God, we thank you for your precious word that you have given us. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that can illuminate our minds with your word and teach us and instruct us and reveal to us what you're saying in your precious word. Lord, it makes no difference what man says, denomination teaches, or anything else. It's on what thus saith the word of God. So God, help us to depend upon your word, be led by the Holy Spirit, teach us, instruct us, prepare our hearts and minds for the teaching of the word. And God, give us wisdom and understanding and discernment. And God, just honor your word and bring forth fruit. May we see someone saved today because of the morning worship service, even for the Sunday school hour. Lord, just bless, restore, heal the sick, comfort, Lord, the distraught. Lord, just encourage the discouraged. Lord, just do your work, God, today as only you can do. And God, we'll continue to praise you throughout Resurrection Day, knowing, God, that we are saved and we have everlasting life. And one day soon, God, we're going to see you face to face. And then these old vile, wretched bodies are going to be glorified. And we'll be with you throughout eternity. Bless your holy name. Lord, because we pray all of this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And hope you join us next week for the Sunday School Hour. That has truly been a blessing. Y'all have a nice Easter. Y'all spend time with your family. And thank y'all for taking the time to watch us. And y'all just uh, take this time and spend with your family and get in the word of God like uh, Brother Green said. And everything's going to work itself out. So with that said, we love you.